A good sequel has to strike a fine balance between nostalgia and innovation. You don't want to remain exactly the same and not to change anything. Then, you're just releasing the old game all over again. But at the same time, you don't want to do anything that's so different that the sequel is completely unrecognizable from the original game. Fortunately, this isn't an issue for Crash Bandicoot 4. Because this game isn't just the perfect sequel with its tightened controls and additional game modes, characters and collectibles, it's also the best damn Crash Bandicoot game yet. You'll see what I mean when I complete Crash Bandicoot 4. It's about time. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. And today, we're playing Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time because this time around, it's about time that we got a new sequel to, to Crash to Crash 3. Um, yeah. Now it's important to know that I did not get paid for this video, but I did get paid to make a cool promotional video for Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. You can check it out right here. There's a link on screen or a little little info card you can go ahead and check out. Uh, please give that video some views and likes because uh, I have put a lot of time into thinking about hamsters and speedrunning. So this game hasn't maybe gone crazy at all. More importantly, I did not get paid to get this video out. They gave me a review copy. So this is a non-sponsored Activision completionist review as we do. So I hope you enjoy Today's episode on Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. It's about time that we start this video. Here comes a new challenger! Yeah. Danger! If you grew up with the PlayStation, you probably grew up with Crash Bandicoot. Naughty Dog's Orange Marsupial blew up on the platform and spun into our hearts with the release of four critically and commercially successful games that many still consider to be some of the best games on the system. These games made Crash the official face of the PlayStation and helped cement the PlayStation as the number one console of the mid to late 90s. But once you get to the top of the mountain, it's very easy to fall down. And boy, did Crash fall. People began to notice with the next game, The Wrath of Cortex. While this looked like a Crash game, something seemed a little off. Everything just had a little less life to it, and things were added for the sake of adding them, not to mention the glitches and the insanely long load times. This was because the developer Naughty Dog had moved on and sold the IP to Activision. They had simply outgrown the title once known as Sonic's Ass Game to move on to many more great titles like the Uncharted and The Last of Us series. Meanwhile, Crash Bandicoot was left in the hands of lesser developers making Crash games that didn't feel like Crash. Although series like Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, and Naughty Dog's very own Jack and Daxter thrived, Crash became a shell of himself that was eventually unrecognizable and left in the bargain bins along with Scalar. Just look at the cover art for Mind Over Mutant. Crash doesn't even look like he wants to be there. His face says, well, that's it. And it was. That is until 2018, when the Insane Trilogy released. This was the beautiful remaster of the first games from the glory days of the Bandicoot. Not only did it look and play great, but it actually felt like Crash. No half-assed development, no tribal tattoos, just all the box breaking we have come to know and love. And it did so well that a remaster of the original Crash Team Racing came out a year later. Crash was back, baby, and the world demanded a true sequel to the original trilogy. And so, here it is. The Crash Crash Bandicoot game fans have been wanting for over 12 years, and the developer Toys for Bob agreed. It is about time. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time starts off with Cortex and Tropy and Uka Uka in the time void they ended up in at the very end of Crash Bandicoot 3. After Uka Uka uses all of their energy to open up a rift to send them all back to the present, and Tropy and Cortex ditch him and use it to travel to different timelines to try and take over the multiverse. Meanwhile, Crash is resting on the beach as he does and is disturbed by a large explosion. Turns out it is the waking of the quantum mask Lonnie Loli, and it now becomes 
Crash and Coco's job to collect all four quantum masks and stop Entropy and Cortex. Okay, this is brilliant because not only does it actually provide good motivation to go through the whole game, but it completely justifies making a sequel to Crash 3, even though many Crash Bandicoot games have come out since then. They're all just different timelines. Great Scott! And while this is a different timeline, the gameplay remains much the same. Platform your way through a level while breaking crates and enemies' faces with your trusty spin, double jump, and slide attacks. But even though the base game remains the same, there have been a ton of additions that make Crash 4 stand out from the pack. Hi, I'm Jonathan GamerFuel with G Fuel Energy, telling you about all the great deals that we got going on at GFuel.com. All right, I'm not Jonathan Gamer Fuel, nor uh, is is any of this outside of the fact that yes, this is a brand deal for G Fuel Energy. Uh, we've actually been working with G Fuel for quite some time now, and honestly, it's been a wonderful partnership. You guys at home have been using our code a lot. It's one of the the true partnerships we've ever had with the company, where they've been. Uh, continuing to support us. They helped us a lot during Indie Land, and uh, their support this year has meant the world to us. So, in case you guys don't know, Geofu Energy uh, offers a different variety of products from uh, like citrus type waters uh, to powders um, that focus in both mixing in with your water for uh, caffeine and, and, and energy, or if you want like a hydration supplement too. They got all different kinds of products out there that you can easily just purchase and mix with water. Uh, my favorite uh, flavor personally is the Sour Phase Berry. That has been one of the best things ever. I am getting really burnt out on soda, especially during the pandemic. I've just been so sick of it. And uh, G Fuel Energy has been such a great alternative. The one that's actually made drinking water kind of exciting again for me personally. So hey, if you want to support us, head over to GFuel.com and use uh, checkout code completionist to get 30% off your order this weekend only. And in case you guys are some Crash Bandicoot fans out there, they do have a Wampa Fruit flavor that is now available on the website. So again, go to gfuel.com and use the keyword completionist on checkout to get 30% off. Or if you're lazy, click the links in the box down below or use the URL on screen right now. Guys, if we sell more G Fuel, they told me that I get my own shaker. Give me a shaker. I want the TOBG fist on a shaker. Let's do it. Fists on cups. That doesn't sound nearly as good as I thought. Fist, gamer fists on cup. That sounds worse. Please cut back to the episode. When you first start Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time, you are greeted by a beach with a Spyro the Dragon floaty, Crunch spelled out in magnets on a refrigerator, and a TV that changes between the first Crash games. After seeing this one moment, it's easy to think that this whole game will be bogged down by nostalgia and references to every other game in the series. However, this is not the case. For while there is a good amount of nostalgia in Crash 4, it is the plethora of new additions and tweaks that make this the best game in the Crash Bandicoot franchise. The first thing that stood out to me immediately were the side levels. Crash Bandicoot has always been a straightforward platformer. Follow the order, get through the game, maybe find some gems or some different pathways to unlock more levels. But Crash 4 introduces two types of new side levels, flashbacks and alternate timelines. The flashback levels show Crash and Coco performing in experiments run by Dr. Cortex right before the first game. Now these are wonderful because not only are they challenging, but they are beautifully retro. These levels you unlock by collecting VHS tapes in each of the regular story levels, and the look of the levels reflect that. Everything has that awesome VHS grain to it, and are dated right before the original Crash Bandicoot game released. Not to mention we learned some pretty great tidbits about Crash and Coco's origins. Did you know that Crash's full name is Crash with Cortex the first? Now you do. Although they don't look as cool, the alternate timeline levels are just as interesting. Each one features a new playable character, Tana, Dingo Dial, and Cortex. Each of them plays completely different to what we're used to with our main heroes. Tana's from an alternate timeline, so naturally she does martial arts and has a grappling hook. Dingo Dial has a vacuum gun and can suck up enemies in crates while firing TNT crates. And finally, Cortex is a ray gun that can turn enemies into platforms and he also has a dash. All of these are a fantastic way to create variety. 
In the older games, this was mostly achieved with the different vehicle levels. These range from fine to frustrating. I'm looking at you, Coco's Jet Ski levels. But the alternate timelines provides just enough change on top of the already fantastic gameplay we've seen in Crash Bandicoot. Instead of getting a completely different dish, you're just getting some different seasoning. And I love that. While all the new characters are fun, my favorite has to be Dingo Dial. With his Australian accent and DGAF attitude, each level of his was a blast to play. But both of these types of levels serve as a great palate cleanser between the main story levels. So what if you want more than the main story levels? Well then, Halfway through the game, you will unlock the inverted levels. Inverted levels are exactly what they sound like, levels that are flipped in the opposite direction. So left becomes right, right becomes left. But the really cool part is the new art style. Every level already looks great, but the inverted levels are true works of art. Some become bright neon colors, while others are invisible until you spin and send a shockwave outlining everything around you. But my personal favorite has got to be the Cortex Towers area, where everything looks like the Game Boy Advance it's Crash Games. It's pretty awesome. These inverted levels give you a great reason to revisit levels and try them again and again. In previous Crash Games, you never got that. You only revisit the levels if you miss some boxes or want to perfect the time trials. Now, I get to enjoy old levels as completely new experiences, and I'm here for it. All of those levels and characters are welcomed additions, but they don't mean anything if they aren't fun to play. And Toys for Bob could have left well enough alone by just leaving the Crash Bandicoot gameplay alone. Instead, they decided to add just as much to the gameplay as well. Some parts are more obvious than others, like the quantum masks that give you various abilities, like slowing down time, altering gravity. But there's also new platforming elements like wall running or rail grinding. But other people have already gone into detail deep detail on why those are awesome. The things that stood out to me the most were the much smaller quality of life changes. First and foremost was the Shadow Circle. One of the biggest complaints with the Insane Trilogy was that people didn't always know where they were going to land. It didn't always feel right to players. Classic players will understand that this is where it came from, but newer players will be off put by this decision. Toys for Bob fixed that right here by literally putting a yellow circle around any of the playable characters. This seems simple and a little cheap to some, but it makes a world of a difference, especially in the sections with a ton of backtracking. It eliminated a lot of the guesswork and made it so I always knew where I was going. If I fell, I had no one to blame but myself. The other change is the ability to switch between modern mode and retro mode. Retro mode plays like all the previous Crash games, right? You collect lives, every time you die, you lose a life and you go back to a checkpoint. If you run out of lives, you get game over, or in this case, are kicked out of a level. Modern mode, on the other hand, eliminates lives altogether. No matter how many times you die, you will always go back to the last checkpoint you reached. This is somewhat game-changing. Crash Bandicoot is notoriously a game that is easy to learn, but very hard to master, and you will die a lot while you play. But now, you have the opportunity to practice and try as many times as you want. So for me personally, this really brings the Crash series into the modern age of gaming. Lives originally were included to add a fake sense of difficulty and ring quarters out of you in the arcade. Here, they're just a nuisance that prevent you from fully enjoying the game. By eliminating lives, Toys for Bob actually made the trial and error of Crash Bandicoot enjoyable. You aren't limited by your failure, you can grow from it. And if you don't want to play that way, there's a switch to put it back to retro mode. It's all of this that makes Crash 4 stand out for me from the rest of the franchise. Toys for Bob could have just made a pretty game that plays and feels exactly the same as the classic Crash games, but instead they took steps to create new content that filled out the world, listened to previous criticism, and brought Crash into a more modern style of play. They cared about what they were doing, and they added so much great stuff because of it. However, it didn't just stop there. Oh no, Toys for Bob had a lot more to add. Previously, I spoke to how a bunch of small tweaks and additions to gameplay made a huge impact on the overall experience for Crash 4. But this isn't the only place where additions were made. We still have to look at the collectibles, and this time, there are so many more things to collect than ever before. The original Crash games only had crystals, gems, and relics. And while the crystals are gone in this game, the gems more than make up for their absence because instead of getting just one gem for every level, there are now six to 12 to collect. You still get your standard gem for breaking all of the crates. That means there's five left. You get one because of a hidden gem in every stage, as well as one more gem for beating the level with less than three deaths. Now, how do we get the other gems? This is where the Wampa Fruits come in. See, in the retro mode, you need Wampa Fruits to get lives, right? No matter what, you need 100 Wampa Fruit to get an extra life. In modern mode, you don't really need them, right? 
wrong. In all modes, no matter what, you need to collect the Wampa Fruit because if you get 80% of the Wampa Fruit in a level, you'll get three gems. So that's three Wampa Fruit gems, one hidden gem, one standard destroying all the crates gem, and one for being the stage without dying three times or less. Times all of that by 38 levels, and that means there's clearly over 200 gems in Crash 4. Well, that doesn't seem so bad, right? Those seem like pretty easy goals to meet with practice. Ah, but you don't do it just once. Remember those cool looking inverted levels? You have to do the same thing on those levels to get the inverted gems. That means I have to break all the boxes again, find the hidden gems, which is in a different location this time around, collect most of the Wampa fruit and not die all over again. Times that by 38 stages. So now we're sitting with well over 400 gems to unlock in this game, right? But we haven't even talked about the four colored gems. The four colored gems are hidden throughout the game that you need in certain levels to find all the boxes. Not to mention one of the last levels in the game requires all four colored gems. Yes, this is a lot of gems. As far as collectibles go, however, you have to get tapes the tapes for those extra VHS levels. And you can only get those if you get to that part of the stage where the tape is if you haven't died. Which brings me to my next collectible, the insanely perfect relics. So in a lot of you guys are saying to yourself, man, these gems, inverted and normal, don't sound too bad. Find the tapes, don't sound too bad. What the hell could the insane relic be? These insanely perfect relics, you get them only if you get all the boxes in the stage and you clear the stage without dying. This gets really hard, especially later on in the game when the truly tricky platforming and mass combinations kick in. Wow, Gerard, that is a ton of stuff. Well, guys, I hope you're buckled in because I'm just getting started. I still have to break every single box in the flashback levels to earn a platinum emblem on those levels, not to mention all the trophies and achievements that come with the game, because you know, video games. And while the trophies and achievements are not as hard as some other games, there is still yet more stuff to do in Crash Band Bandicoot 4. Come on, Toys for Bob. I got other shit to do. Now, longtime fans of Crash Bandicoot will know the next thing I'm going to talk about because one, if you've watched my other Crash videos, I've talked about them extensively. And two, yes, it is the biggest pain in my ass. The damned time trial relics. See, these were the bane of my existence in most of the Crash Bandicoot games. Not only were they hard to get, but you didn't even get anything for unlocking them. They easily took up a majority of my time recompleting Crash Bandicoot 2 and 3. But for Crash 4, they're even harder. I had to keep trying every stage over and over and over again, just hearing Crash scream, whoa, so many times as I would die in the same spot as at the time before. Again and again and again and again and again and again. And you know what? Uh, I enjoyed a lot of it, but man, does it suck balls. It sucks really big Wampa Fruit balls. Look, this was really tough. All these different collectibles seemed daunting when I first started this completion journey, but I was surprised that as I kept playing, there wasn't really any big burnout for me. I was having fun and felt completely satisfied the entire time. This is partially because the game keeps rewarding you for the gems in the form of skins, which are different costumes for Crash and Coco to wear. These range from cool to funny to nostalgic and work as a great incentive to complete as much as possible as you play. Essentially, the more you complete, the more you earn. In my opinion, this is one of the best ways to encourage your players to complete your games. If you unlock things, you get more things. And what's awesome is that the cutscenes in the game reflect the skins that you see and equip. However, I really feel that the saving grace here is modern mode. Because I couldn't get kicked out of a level for dying multiple times in a given section, I wanted to keep experimenting. This meant that when it came time for me to get that perfect run or get the platinum relic, I had my game plan ready ahead of time. I didn't have to keep restarting when I failed. This is the perfect way to leave this game. So much work, but a true sense of satisfaction. However, Toys for Bob couldn't leave well enough alone again. There's even more time trials. Yes, that's right, folks. You can go beyond platinum all the way to purple. The purple time relics represent the developer's times and they are impossible that you have to be a speedrunner to do these. These are seriously not fun. Already, I would spend hours trying to perfect the platinum time relics. And then I would see the purple time relic scores afterwards and they were anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute and a half faster. It's ludicrous. This was made even worse by the way this game has made you move faster. At the very end of Crash 3, you unlock the Crash dash. You would hold R2 and be able to sprint faster. This was a great way to quickly speed through levels and nail those risky time trials. 
However, in Crash Bandicoot 4, this is replaced with the triple dash. Essentially, you have to keep rhythmically mashing the spin attack button. In doing so, you build three different levels of your dash, which meant you always had to go dash, 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 to keep your momentum going all the time. This made it so much harder to plan routes and maneuver myself when I'm constantly doing small bursts of speed as opposed to one constant sprint. Now look, I have played a lot of games in my days, guys. You've been here for a long time with me on this journey. It's been a blast. When have any of you ever heard that I got physically exhausted or burnt out while playing a game because it was really hard to play? My thumbs have cuts and bruises. I have been playing this game nonstop ever since it came out. Sometimes one level would take me eight hours to beat. And that's just the platinum relics. I'm not even good enough to get one of those stupid purple relics. I have one purple relic. It was on a dingo dial level. And that's because that stage was super easy. And here's the tricky part in all of this. The dev purple relics do not affect completion criteria. So what do you get for getting the purple relics? At this time, it's just pure bragging rights and nothing else. There is nothing you get for earning every purple relic in the game, and there's no way that I can physically do it in a reasonable amount of time to make this video. So, I pulled an audible. I did not do the purple time relics, because here's the reality. I don't want to waste months of my life trying to perfect this part of a game that doesn't reward me for it, and I don't enjoy it. These felt like more of a slap in the face than a fun challenge, which is a shame because the rest of the game is so good. So once you get to 100% in the game, you earn a genuinely funny cutscene that serves as an epilogue for all of the characters you meet throughout Crash 4. But as it is so often the case with the Crash Bandicoot series, the game does not end at 100%. This time it ends at 106%, and this results in another cutscene serving as a teaser for a possible sequel. A sequel that I really hope happens, you guys. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is a perfect Crash game. It looks and feels incredible while continuing the tradition of the original Crash three games. There is a ton to do and it is unbelievably satisfying. That is, until you get to those platinum and purple time relics. Those things are monstrous and in my opinion are not even worth attempting. However, if you strive for that 100% and even to get those platinum relics for that 106% mark, then Crash 4 is absolutely worth your time. When I completed Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. There were hundreds upon thousands of deaths. Seriously, you're going to die a lot, but being in modern mode made this a lot more palatable. 21 platinum flashback emblems earned. Really easy, but a nice change of pace from the franticness of the rest of the game. 52 trophies earned. Fun overall, but barely noticeable next to everything else I had to collect. You complete the game, you get the platinum. Pretty simple. 58 skins unlocked, my personal favorite being Crash's pirate skin. I love pirates. 460 gems. This includes the clear, the inverted, and the colored gems. And about half of these I had to get in a single run in order to earn 38 insanely perfect relics. This was definitely a challenge, but it was fun. It's for sure a new way to look at Crash Bandicoot levels. 38 platinum time relics earned. 126 hours and 30 minutes of total playtime. Crash 4, while not my favorite, is the absolute best Crash Bandicoot of all time. I love the masks, I love the playable characters, I love all the collectibles, I love all the different styles of gameplay here. The only thing that really took the wind out of my sails, once again, was the time trial platinum relics, more specifically, even those dev purple ones. They're brutal and not in a fun way, and those dev times don't even add your total percentage, so at this time, 106% is the way to go. Uh, I don't know if I think it's necessarily important to get those secret endings, but at the very least, it does give us hope. The triple dash, while a fun idea in practice, is a difficult task for those of you out there who are struggling to play this game. Your hands will hurt, my hands are, are cut and bruised from doing it. Trust me, just beat the game and you'll be having a good time regardless. So. With that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it.